Hey, how's it going? Good, thanks. How are you? Good, good, good. Where are you at, just out of curiosity? <laughs> I'm in L- um, in L.A. at the moment, so I'm um, just in um, in Hollywood uh, at an office. Oh, okay. Sorry for the uh, hot weather in Los Angeles. <laughs> well, you know, I'm just at, uh, I'm just coming from New York City, which I have to say was unlike anything I've ever experienced. It was so hot and humid and crazy last week. It was um, yeah, it was tough. So uh, this is like a relief now. <laughs> Oh, well, ho- hopefully you'll have a chance to uh, hit the beach of Los Angeles, and it'll be nice. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So uh, let's talk about your movie, uh, Cockneys vs. Zombies. Um, first of all, I want to know is, uh, what makes this zombie movie different from the rest of the zombie movies? <laughs> That's a very valid question, and the one that I kept asking myself um, all the way through. So... Um, when it came about, the re- the, when I started, came up with the idea, and you know, films take a, quite a few years to develop and finance and make and release, so um, it's been a little while ago, um, but I was working with a couple of actors, Cockney actors, in, on a web series, mm-hmm. and I just, um, and it was so funny, that the way Cockneys have their swagger, their attitude, they kind of don't show any fear, don't, are never faced by anything, and you know, even when faced with a super act, natural enemy, they would never question what is this. They would just kind of go, oh my God, something is attacking me. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then, um, lovely, have some of this. Cock the shotgun and bang, blast them away. Fuck off. And, um, and just have this sort of big swagger, big attitude, and, and no fear in their face, ever. And I like the idea of, um, of doing a, a film like that, um, with, you know, a, a, basically a horror film where the protagonist isn't scared and they're gangsters, so they're not, um, they're not weak, they're not screaming, they don't run away, they have shotguns, they fight back, and um, they don't take anything, any shit from the zombies, basically. So I kind of felt that was, um, I hadn't seen that in, in, you know, in any British film, to be honest. You know, while we were developing, Zombieland came out, which is an amazing film, it's a similar thing, but, you know, no one's ever done that sort of thing in England, in London. You know, the uh-huh. Shaun of the Dead, which is like a romantic comedy with with middle class people and zombies. You know, this was to me like a gangster movie with zombies, a caper. You know, a fun film. Um, so I kind of felt that was sort of one of the um, key points where. I thought it's a justification for this movie to exist. And of course, um, the other thing was, at the time, Walking Dead hadn't come out, so I was sort of saying, well, everyone's doing sparse zombies. But, you know, I love the slow zombies back um, back from the day, of course, there's the... Um, um, uh, so the old, the old, you know, the old school zombies, and and that, that was sort of influenced by Brain Dead and um, Peter Jack. Well, it's called Dead Alive here. Peter Jackson's Dead Alive from the eighties, yeah. which I sort of watched on VHS back in the day when it was illegal, um, and then um, it was outlawed where I grew up actually, and then also films like um, um, Sam Raimi's Evil Dead Two was a big influence for me, um, and. Um, and, oh yeah, so at the time everyone was doing um, fast-moving zombies, but I kind of said, well, you know, we're, we're going to make a fun film, I want the Cockneys to have um, their quips and their banter as the zombies approach, we need to do do slow-moving zombies. And at the time everyone said, well, you can't do slow-moving zombies because no one's scared, audiences are not used to them anymore, and uh-huh. they want fast zombies. And then of course, you know, I kind of insisted on it, and then uh, um, The Walking Dead came out, now it's all, all sorts of zombies are back again. Um, but you know, um, with the slow moving zombies, I thought it was key that um, even though the zombies are slow, our cockney pensioners with their wheelchairs and zimmer frames are even slower. And I kind of felt that was something that I hadn't seen in any zombie film before. And uh, uh, unless you pro- uh, unless you remember anything, but I kind of felt that was an, another unique uh, thing that you know, especially the slow motion and chase and those kind of things, action sequences where the where the heroes you know can hardly. You know, it takes them forever to walk from A to B. Yeah. I thought it was a, a, an interesting conceit for a zombie movie. Um, and it was also interesting on set, you know, when, it, when the scene, when the script says, pensioners walk from the bridge to the docks, uh-huh. and you sort of stage it, and you kind of go, oh my God, it takes them 15 minutes to do that. Um, it sort of, it poses all sorts of new challenges in terms of staging, but it's also a lot of fun, you know. So those are the sort of key thoughts why this film sort of should exist and also you know there's um to me it's kind of 
like uh, another reviewer told me was that the only zombie movie he's seen that is actually uplifting and positive. Um, and that was sort of key to me as well. That it's not, I treated it more like an adventure movie than necessarily a horror movie. To me, it was like a cockney adventure with zombies, you know, mm -hmm. a bunch of robbers caught up in a zombie outbreak rather than the tr maybe traditional horror film structure. Um, and it didn't make it contained on purpose either. I wanted it to be, you know, roving around the East London and show off the landscapes and be much more epic than you'd expect from a, a small, you know, indie horror film. So those were the four thoughts going into it. And then, of course, James Moran and me, we kept asking, well, what else can we give the viewer that um, they haven't seen before in a zombie film? Like, um, uh, for example, the um, Mr. Mickey character with the steel plate in it. So, uh, you know, he can't, can't be killed. Mm -hmm. And it's the unkillable zombie. And um, so all those little details. So, okay. Wow, that's a, that's quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't put all don't give away too much in the in, in the review, especially the steel plate bit. Of course, I don't. I guess people will know, but um, yeah, uh, it's lots of little things we try to put in to make it special, basically. Okay, terrific. Now, um, for American audiences, um, since um, I'm an American, uh, you know, um, internet site, um, we're not quite familiar. No, I'm a big fan of Latino review, by the way. I read it, so I'm completely aware. Oh, terrific. Um, we're, we're not quite familiar with uh, Cockneys. Who are Cockneys? So the official um, definition of a Cockney is um, an East Londoner who is born within the sounds of the bow bells. And this is Bishop's church that sort of rings every day. And if you can hear it when you wake up, you're officially a Cockney. Um, of course, Cockneys are also known for their funny... Uh, Cockney rhyming slang, which is, you know, using words that, um, that rhyme to, to describe something like apple and pears means stairs. Um, and then, of course, uh, Trafalgar means zombie, but I'm not going to tell you how that works. That's uh -huh. going to be in the movie. Um, and then also, on the other hand, of course, Cockneys are known to be um, uh, partial, maybe unfairly so, to a criminal activities and um, being very good with, um, with machetes and knuckle dusters and shotguns. Oh, I see. Which makes them uniquely... Oh, and also, of course, at the same time, what sort of makes a, a Cockney uniquely qualified to um, be the best person to survive a zombie apocalypse is the fact that they um, stick together um, as a sort of family to protect their community and they uh, show a united front to anyone who tries to invade their turf. Um, so I would recommend American listeners that um, if they are caught up in a, a zombie apocalypse by, um, by accident, they should find the nearest Cockney, gang up with him, and they'll be in a safe spot and probably safer than anyone else. <laughs> if, if, if we could identify a Cockney on the street. Are, are you a Cockney yourself? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I've been living in East London for 12 years now, so um, I sort of, to me it's my love decoration to my foster home for that time. But um, I am sort of a bit of a mutt. I was grown in, uh, born in Singapore, grew up in Berlin, lived in London for a long time, spent a lot of time in America. So, you know, it, but um, it was sort of my love decoration to East London for having lived there for so long. <laughs> you know, one of the, uh, I've seen many zombie movies and it's also um, sometimes uh, politics getting in the way in, in America um, over the debate of guns. And I always hear people um, saying, um, there are no guns in England, and uh, when I watch this movie, they're just somehow <laughs> the Cockneys managed to get tons of guns. I know. Um, when the trailer came out on on YouTube, there was like literally hundreds of posts of people arguing about that. Um, but wait a second, you guys in England don't have guns like that. That's not true. And yeah. you know, it just went on and on and, on and, and, and made me smile. Um, I think, of course. Um, you know, British movies aren't really known for um, gunslinging in the same way that maybe American um, movies are. And I think um, while there is a lot of guns, for example, our armorer had a whole... Uh, but all these guns are basically out of his own personal collection, um, mm -hmm. which, of course, is licensed and all those sort of things. But um, there, there are guns, and um, and uh, but they, you can't as a um, public person get access to them. So that's why in the film there's a specific scene where, they, where one crazy character that has this big armory that we, you know, they basically um, tool up at. Um, I mean, for me, I think what I liked about the concept is that um, even though, you know, there's a lot of shooting 
going on. To me, it feels like in a zombie movie, it's kind of fantasy violence, and it's kind of, to me, it's a release rather yeah. than a, and, you know, it's not promoting violence because, you know, all they ever shoot is zombies, you know, more, you know, apart from once or twice. But um, I think um, that was important to me, that it, and that also that was part of the fun, that, you know, the colonies could be just tool up, get all the big guns out, and then just go on a rampage, basically, and, um, and you'll be okay with it because it's just zombies. Oh, wow. Yeah, now, um, let's talk about your uh, Cockney cast here. Um, y you have a, a pretty good cast. Um, I, I recognize uh, Alan Ford in there. And I also even recognize uh, former Bond girl uh, Honor Blackman. Honor Blackman. Yeah. Um, talk about your recruitment uh, for, for the cast for this um, movie. Well, you know what? Of course, the movie is called Cockneys vs. Zombies, which, um, you know, versus movies, you know, you could do on the cheap and not put a lot of care into it, and it, and it works financially. But um, all the way through, I always kept pushing and, you know, making the script, developing the script really well, so, you know, it'd be special and have a lot of um, themes on top of just zombies and Cockneys. And I think um, when we send out the script to the actors, they really responded, you know, to the humor of it, the emotion in it, and um, the sort of almost like it's quite charming at the same time as being sort of action-packed and all the other things. So we had just a really good response from actors. And what I really wanted to do with the cast is sort of, when people read the cast, I wanted them to go, oh, that's a really interesting lineup of people you wouldn't necessarily expect in, um, in a Cockneys versus Zombies movie. And I wanted to get a really interesting bunch of character actors together who just would take those um, roles and transform them and make them theirs and really sort of act basically to the ensemble cast uh -huh. so um you know we wrote it specifically for alan ford in, with alan ford in mind and um so when he read it he kind of picked up on that and uh, luckily he said yes because to me it was sort of a key sort of piece in the in the casting puzzle because he's so cockney that um you know, everyone else around him could be a little bit less cockney, and he would still, you know, take them under his wings and sort of show them what it means to be a real cockney. And, you know, um, he did do that. And then, of course, you know, on a black man, she grew up, um, well, she was born in East London as well, and then, um, at, you know, moved to West London and had elocution lessons and was very well spoken now. But she was excited about playing a, an action-packed cockney role. Mm -hmm. And, um... You know, of course, for me, it was like, oh, my God, a Bond girl. And, you know, you look into her beautiful eyes and your knees wobble. And um, and it was great. And, uh, you know, even at her age, she was one of the oldest cast members. She was so, like, strong and powerful and energetic. And I remember her um, like, um, coming up to me. We were doing the pension home breakout scene, and I was lining up weapons for the pensioners from from the kitchen that they were breaking out from. So it was knives and forks and egg whisks. And she looked at me and said, no, 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 Matthias. I want the sledgehammer. So, so I said, okay, the sledgehammer. We got her a rubber sledgehammer, and then um, uh -huh. she obviously, she started wielding that and knocking zombies out left, right, and center. And we were like, everyone in the crew was just silent, watching <laughs> with like a, a dry mouth going, oh my God. <laughs> you know, it was fantastic. She was amazing. Wow. You know, and I want to, I want to sort of talk about all the cast members and not leave anyone out. But you know, with sure. Michelle Ryan, who's beautiful, Georgia King, who, who's really funny, um, and was in, is in the new Normal at the moment on TV. Tony Gardner is a great um, comedy actor. Richard Bryer is, is a legendary British TV comedy actor. He um, unfortunately passed away um, in February, so I um, want to dedicate the film to him. Um, you know, a lot of great people to work with. So I was, uh, I was blessed on set. Wow, that's that is an impressive cast. Um, now, I also notice uh, while you're while you're making the film, um, you use uh, traditional makeup on these zombies, but um, a lot of the violence were uh, CGI. Could you explain a little bit about that? Um, the, oh, the, uh, the CGI violence. Okay. Um, well, uh, when I was sort of my approach to the film was I wanted to. Um, sort of rooted in reality as much as possible. So as much as possible, I tried to do um, real prosthetics. And my prosthetic supervisor, Paul Hyatt, did an amazing job in, in some of those sort of real blood kind of skin stretchy things and um, head explosions and, and all those sort of practical gags. Um, when it came to some of the bigger gun battles, what you find on set is if you, um, when you start using squibs and, and um, and, and 
real, you know, real muzzle flashes. It becomes quite a big deal to just kind of put those things on. It takes about an hour each time, and they fire. And if it doesn't work, you have to take another set of clean clothes, do it again, and um, and it takes a long time. It's a very big budget kind of thing to do. Uh-huh. Also with with the machine guns when you shoot like. If Alan Ford was to um, shoot an AK-47 next to Michelle Ryan, yes. she would get really worried because it ejects 30 bullets a second, all of them hot, and um, and sort of, and they might hit her face. And you know, as an actress, you kind of don't want to do that. So in the end, when you do the real bullets, you have to really stage it quite compli- in a complicated way, so everyone is sort of has their own um, trajectory, you know, has their safety zone, and it makes um, doing an action sequence. Uh, quite long winded and it takes a little bit of the energy away and also a little bit of the you know that you can't line people up in quite an as an iconic position so we sort of tried to do a combination where whenever i couldn't shoot real effects what i did is um shoot um edit the film and then shoot specific green screen plates so we had like um bullet ejections or or um, blood effects that would just really match to each each shot and what each shot needed to achieve so trying to make it look like a real custom effect, even though we used a little bit of CGI magic to put it all together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, um, now, um, now I also understand this is also your, technically your uh, first directorial uh, feature film um, debut. How, how did that go, and what was the greatest challenge for you? <laughs> well, um, I think, um, I mean, first of all, it was a fantastic experience, and, um, you know, I loved going around festivals and, and showing the film to audiences because it's sort of a, it's a it's the fanboy in me making a film for the fans and you know to, to, to there's nothing quite like um, you know going to a horror festival and seeing the lights go down in a sold out sort of theatre and then you know everyone having a good time and laughing and clapping and all those all those sort of things you know that's what you make movies for really um, um, so that was an amazing experience of course on set it was. Um, um, my decision to not make a contained sort of movie meant that every day of the shooting schedule was just like a, a crazy sort of um, a challenge of, of um, chore- choreographing like 10 actors, half of which over 70 years old, you know, 50, 40, 50 zombie backgrounds, guns fighting, prosthetics, mm-hmm. um, complicated post-apocalyptic art direction in, in the sets. Um, on two cameras every day, you know, it was sort of, um, it was a real, sort of, it felt like a, a big movie thing, but at the same time, you know, we had to de- get it done really quickly, so it had to be super decisive, and I think um, it was sort of only one day where we had three actors talking to each other in a room, and I was like, oh, that's how easy it is, you know, and it's that sort of, the, the sort of contained setup, but, yeah. um, I, you know, I had a great time because, you know, it sort of, um, it was so much fun to have everyone pull together to put it together and, and um you know my production manager still says oh you know there's nothing quite nothing quite caught me versus zombies since because we had just so many things happening all the time and it was sort of fun and super exhausting but really fun terrific i'm going to give you a fun question okay okay um if the zombie apocalypse um occurred today what are you going to do to survive Okay, so um, first, in, in case of the zombie apocalypse, the first thing to do is um, find the nearest cockney because um, they are the most genuinely um, qualified to survive the zombie apocalypse because um, they stick together as a family, they, they don't um, fight amongst each other, and they, get, they show a united front against the zombie um, invasion. Um, of course, uh, the next um, thing to do is you have to get stock up and get weapons. So um, get anything you can, whether it's um, pitchforks, machetes, guns, um, shotguns, anything that's good for taking heads off. Then um, raid the nearest supermarket, lock down um, a place to stay. Make sure that the people you're with are your friends, and then um, also make sure that there's a good gender mix in the group that you um, put together, because if it happens that you're the last people alive on Earth, you want to make sure that you can, um, you know, do uh, fun things with each other and, um, and ensure the, the um, survival of the human race. <laughs> great answer, great answer. <laughs> Now, alas, of course, uh, I could keep on talking with you forever, but, you know, 
um, interv interviews can't last forever. So I, I just want to talk about, uh, so what are your future projects from here, and are we going to see maybe certain sequels like, you know, Cockneys versus Vampires or Mummies or anything else? <laughs> Cockneys versus Leprechauns, or um, Cockneys versus Zombies 2, The Battle for Whopping. Yeah. Um, um, you know, I think um, people ask about sequels, uh, unless people run my door down to have one, I think um, we all put all our love into this one film, and I kind of feel um, I'm happy with that. <laughs> um, I think, um, obviously we left it open for a sequel, but I think um, I'm, I'm quite happy to leave it as, as, as the one film, and I'm not a, you know, I, I like the idea we had this one um, um, film that isn't a sequel and a remake, and um, I'm happy to leave it at that. And, um, and what about personal projects for you then? Well, um, I've been developing a science fiction film with an American writer called Ian Shaw, who, um, who wrote a film called Splinter a few years ago, a horror film. And um, we just recently, actually, just yesterday, which is exciting news, um, finalized a contract with 20th Century Fox and a producer called Hutch Parker, who, who um, produced Wolverine. Um, and so we're starting on doing some studio of rights, uh, uh, tweaks of the script, and I'm hoping that we can nurture it to a green light within the studio system. It's a, it's a, it's a man on the run thriller about a, a guy who starts receiving chrome capsules containing holographic messages from his future self. And um, I think, well, I'm really excited about it. It's science fiction, but it's also it's fun and thrilling, and, um, and um, you know... I'm very excited about it, but at the same time, you know, we, we're sort of in the process of putting it together in its early days, but um, that's next for me, for sure, anyway. Well, what, what's the name of that film? Capsule. Cap, cap, like, capsule? Uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, okay, terrific. And is that the only project you have? I, I do have other projects, and I think... Um, but, but it's not ready but, to announce? I don't want to jinx anything. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Oh. You know, you, you nurture them, and then you know when they, when they're ready, then they they um pop over, you know, then then they happen. But um, until that happens, sometimes it's good to keep it keep it all um in the nurturing stage. <laughs> okay, well, I um terrific. I I appreciate the talk here. I just noticed you just added me on Twitter, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No. Okay, thank you. And um, and if you have any more questions, um, you know, get in touch on Twitter and uh, or anything. And um, thanks again for you know interviewing me for Latino Review, which, like I say, I read it and I'm, I'm a big fan. Okay, terrific. Wait, thank you very much. God bless. Thank okay, you. Bye. You too. Thanks, bye. Cake. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. And then uh, last one up for today, we have got Brian Simon over at uh, Shakya. Okay, great. So I will connect you guys now. One sec.